Welcome to a special edition of Anglican on Scripted Episode 667. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 8th, 2021. All right, I alluded to this being a special episode. Well, what makes 667 so special? It's not 666. For some 300 episodes, people have been, hey, what are you guys going to talk about in 666? Are you having Gavin back for 666? 666 is, you know, you need to talk about because that's end times. And uh, I had so many suggestions for what to talk about during episode 666. Now that 666 is finally over and I will never have to deal with it again, because 1666 is that's completely different it's over it's done now i do note with much irony that we hit 6666 subscribers on the day i launched the episode but that's that's superstitious george it, you, that doesn't that's just superstitious well and and i should say that the pick six lot of numbers were not 666666 from florida yesterday Correct. so <laughs> it it stopped at a certain stage, stopped at a certain point. So the, my collective sigh, and this is a special episode, because now we can move on from the hysteria of a number found in the book of Revelation, which could mean many things to many different people. And for me, it's just a fun number. Um, we move on. George, uh, as we move on, before we get too far... You have an important role as audience members. Your, your role here is to help us do free advertising. Free advertising is conducted when you hit the like button on Facebook or YouTube. It's also conducted when you share this on your Facebook page or you send the email. This is the new episode of Anglican Unscripted. 667. You need to watch it. So if you guys could do that, be great. Lots of wonderful comments this week. We really appreciate that. Uh, well over half of you noticed that the subscriber count was 666. Thank you for adding that to our daily lock. George, what are you doing this week? How's it going? Well, t t my wife is out in California in Eureka with my daughter, Laura. Laura uh, was visiting us and is headed back uh, west. Uh, Laura had to have some elective surgery, and evidently the hospitals in Florida are, are in California are now reopening, but they're so backed up that if she wanted her elective surgery within this year, she had, she had to come to Florida. So she came to Florida and my wife went back with her to care for her for a week or so. And Laura took with her my iPods. Your ear pods. <laughs> my ear pods. And I didn't really mind because they always fall out. I guess I've got a big head because if I turn my head this way, they fall out. <laughs> But she bought me these wonderful Chinese no-name made instead of white, they're black. The problem is my new machine, iMac, uh, Mac Mini, can't recognize these, can't find these. So Kevin and I were f uh, fiddling around before the show trying to get the sound to work. And so now we're back uh, to headphones till I get a new uh, earpiece that can work with our system. Yeah, I'll send you and, uh, the, our official uh, one somewhere. But it is also my anniversary today. Susan and I, no, it's not our 66th anniversary. It's our 36th anniversary today. We got well, married when we were 21. So here we are 36 years later. Well, congratulations, George. I mean, yeah, you've set the bar very high for people from their 80s who get married because uh, uh, I count just from my friend, friend class, uh, probably 55% made it this far. Yeah, it's. I, I when I went to my last college reunion, because uh -huh. probably half of us got married within a year or two after college. I guess maybe it's the luck of the draw, but everybody's still together. No kidding! Uh, oh, wow, that's really good. But, but this, this was ten years ago for a twenty-fifth reunion. Well, whenever it was, whenever our twenty-fifth reunion was, uh, but. You know, it's it's just uh, it's just fascinating that uh, morality works if you're faithful to your wife. If you know, Kevin and I grew up in the in an era that it's not as bad as today, but it was pretty bad back then in sexual. In in, in other words, the cool thing was to sleep around, do drugs, drink, do this, do that, the other thing. Um, 
But, you know, traditional morality works. If you're faithful to your wife, if you put your mind to it, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like, you know, long-term relationships are just happen. You have to work at it. But, man, it is such a blessing. So I can, I can say that it's the best thing that has ever happened to me in my life is my marriage. I survived the University of Wisconsin. With your liver <laughs> intact. <laughs> With my, yeah, I don't remember a lot of my freshman year, but I still survived. I mean, that was uh, you know something I, I, I set the bar high to. A lot of people... Kept I mean, and friends, you have to remember, Kevin's liver is in great shape, and he has no criminal record. No criminal record. <laughs> from, from the 80s at the University of Wisconsin. I mean, that is an accomplishment. <laughs> Never he convicted. Wasn't, he wasn't pinched on that bus hijacking <laughs> no. that they drove. In. Was that you who drove it into the lake, or was it No, one else? year before I went to school, the... Uh... The senior class stole the city bus and drove it into the lake, you know. So I, I had a lot to look forward to, and Mom kept warning me, please, pl please, please. My life is too high profile, Kevin, for you to screw it up. I said, yes, Mom, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Okay, so uh, episode 667 is going to have a lot of great stories. Um, one of my favorite people I met early on in my travels with the Anglican TV going around the world was Manir Anis. He's the uh, kind of the presiding bishop of uh, Jerusalem in the Middle East and had a wonderful time when we met up in Charleston a couple times. I uh, met up at uh, some uh, Lambeth events. Didn't meet up at any GAFCON events, but we, you know, uh, certainly... Global, Global South events. Global South events. And so one of the great characters of um, a person who observed the fracturing of the Anglican Communion, who commented on it, and who tried to stop the fracturing of the Anglican Communion. He was uh, yeah, certainly a person uh, early on in the, in the Windsor Report process and all those who said, we need to meet, we need to tell the Episcopal Church to stop. And he was willing to go and tell the Episcopal Church to stop. There are, a lot, there are about a thousand bishops, Anglican bishops around the world. Mm -hmm. And Munir Nice, who retired, I believe, Sunday, mm -hmm. Archbishop Foley Beach and some uh, other Global South primates, uh, we're at a farewell service at All Saints Cathedral in Cairo on Sunday. And if you look on Facebook and if, and later today on Anglican Inc., you'll see pictures from that service. Of those thousand bishops, Munir and Nice is probably within that handful of bishops who have made and are making a difference in the Anglican world. Mm -hmm. Munir and Nice, a diocese of Egypt is relatively small, say, compared to a British diocese or a Nigerian diocese. But the impact he's had both on his society and on the writer Anglican world is disproportionately larger than any of his peers. Within Egypt, Munir Nice has basically built the institution of the Anglican Diocese of Egypt. Uh, he's expanded it from Egypt to now North Africa, down to the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia, and it's now its own province, the province of Alexandria its status within the country, where I don't know how many pictures I have posted of Munir Nice with the Coptic Patriarch and the President of Egypt in these meetings of Christian and state leaders. Before, you wouldn't see the Anglicans there. You'd see the Coptic Patriarch and the Catholics, but you wouldn't see the Anglicans. Munir moved the Anglican Church by his force of personality, by his intellect, by his faithfulness and his presence into a player within the Egyptian intellectual religious life. And certainly within the Anglican world, he was one of the prominent, prominent members. Well, he was able to thread the needle. Okay. Politics in the Middle East is a lot different jungle than the politics uh, or worldview that we understand. And he was able to, within the Islamic communities, within uh, the politics of the uh, of the Middle East succeed, and uh, I give him uh, many kudos for that. Now, like some of the things he had to work with, let's let's take Gafcon for instance. Um, Munir and East for many years have been working on the Church of England to help them with a specific issue. Churches in Algeria, for instance, uh, the big Anglican church in Algeria was built 
next to the British Embassy. And at one point, the British Embassy said, well, that's ours. Now, and Munir Nees had to go through the House of Lords and to Michael Nazar Ali. He tried with uh, the, the archbishops to finally get the British government to give back the church in Algeria. So he had to play ball. And he, ne and he always was reliant on the goodwill of the Archbishop of Canterbury while Egypt was going through that uh, Arab Spring and when Egypt, when the Christians were under more persecution from the Muslim Brotherhood government, he could count on Rowan Williams and uh, Justin Welby to stand up and get the British Foreign Office to do something. So that in return meant that Ro he had to tread a careful line. He could criticize, but he couldn't walk away because if he walked away, he'd be in trouble with that major ally. And like for Gaft conference, it's when the Jerusalem conference was held. The Coptic patriarch had said that no Christian from Egypt may go to Israel. Now, the government in Egypt says, yeah, you can go to Israel. We have diplomatic relations. And Munir Nis himself was free to go, but he had to weigh the value of sending a team to Gathcon versus losing the friendship and of the Coptic church in Egypt. So he's had to balance, and he's done it so successfully that he's regarded as being on side by the Coptic Patriarch, by the Global South, by Gafcon, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, while at the same time he has been saying hard truths to Justin Welby and Michael Curry for and, many years. And Rowan Williams. And Rowan Williams. Yeah. And Catherine Jefford Shore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good job in your uh, your your ministry when you're in East, and we, we thank you for uh, serving the church fo so faithfully, can, and enjoy your retirement. Let, let me, can I share a little anecdote? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, Ke Kevin and I have attended, up until recently, almost all the primates meeting, because the last few, they don't matter anymore, because of the because they're all scripted and boycotted. But when they actually mattered, when news was made and decisions were make, taken, Munir Nice was one of the guys who would talk to us. And I can remember where Kevin and I were like both trying to hear a cell phone and Munir is talking from the men's room uh, in a break. <laughs> and so we get it, you know, he was our deep throat, not always our deep throat, but mm -hmm. on occasion, uh, he was the deep throat, and I remember the echo from the men's room toilet stall. That uh, I got to take a leak, guys. I'll be right back. Kevin George, guess what happened? He <laughs> gets right. <laughs> no, it, a, a great servant, uh, obviously, and not afraid to talk to the press. Mm -hmm. Not the reason he's getting a, 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 his own section on Anglican on Script today, but uh, he's getting his, his his section here because he saved for, so faithfully in the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, boy, Jeff Walton, uh, a frequent contributor to Anglican Unscripted and Anglican.inc, posted a story about, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say it this way, the Grinch who stole Christmas. Uh, the uh, tech Fort Worth ended up in court, and the court said to the Episcopal Church, the Dennis Cannon doesn't apply here, <clears throat> and you can't take these churches uh, away from the, the forming act in a diocese. They voted to leave. They are allowed to vote to leave. Uh, neutral principles apply here. And it, it took a while to work out. Well, it's finally worked out. All, there's nothing else the Episcopal Church can do to fight in court, but they can still make it difficult for the ACNA diocese to receive the properties. And George, they have done what I call the Grinch. They have taken everything, the staples. They have taken the pictures, the you know, the carpeting, the pews, the altars, the lecterns, the processional crosses, the prayer books. That, that we're walking into these churches that have you know been won rightfully in court, um, and they're empty. Yeah, this I I think uh, Fort Worth should hire some divorce lawyers who are good at this stuff. Because this strikes me as, as Kevin says, the Grinch who stole Christmas, or is one of these nasty divorce cases where the wife, you know, burns the husband's clothes rather than allowing him to take his stuff at the settlement. What happened? Uh, 2009, we had the division. 
Uh, some, some parishes declined to follow Bishop Iker, and they remained loyal to the National Church. Had litigation for years where the National Church tried to get all the parishes on their side. And the National Church set the, ter set the terms of the game, winner take all. This what I mean at the beginning. Jack Eicher was willing to talk to these parishes who wanted to leave and work out ways to basically let everybody thrive. Episcopal Church's lawyers from New York said, "No, it's winner take all. We take everything." They couldn't conceive that they would lose everything. Well, they lost everything, and in February, I think of this year, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear the the appeal from of the Texas Supreme Court, which gave the real property which is the books, the altars, the furnishings, everything that's not nailed or everything that's not built into the building that was acquired before the break in 2009, that belongs to the uh, Ryan Reed, Jack Iyer, Isis, along with the buildings. And Suzanne Gill, the uh, communications officer of the Diocese of Fort Worth, has published pictures of all, all saints are all souls in Fort Worth and the church in Wichita Falls of a month before and a month after. And month before, you have altars and pews and hymn books and little wall boards on the walls with hymn numbers and an organ and, and vestments and curtains and all this stuff. And then after the building was returned, you have a warehouse. Um, everything was stripped from these churches and the utilities were turned off that's and, the big now this is the big thing there, there was no maintenance to these buildings for years some of these churches there was no maintenance for nine years and texas is hard on buildings on roofs and things and there's not even certificate of occupancy uh certificates on the wall next to the men's room anymore so if the fire marshal comes they don't have a current certificate of occupancy and so they've got to go through all I mean, what possible need do you have for a certificate of occupancy for a building you don't own? This is, I'm embarrassed by the behavior of Episcopalians as an Episcopal priest. This is unchristian behavior. This is venal. This is not motivated by any sense of godliness or holiness or love. You know, this is not love your enemy. Uh, this is let's make them let's poison let's poison the waters as we withdraw from the from the field it's not how christians behave no. as a contrast the church that uh, i belong to christ church parish watertown connecticut when we uh, voted to leave the diocese and i think joined back at that time bishop murdoch out of uh uganda kenya uh, kenya uh we called up the bishop we said we're going to have an irish we voted I called the bishop we voted to leave we're going to have an irish wake in a week you're invited to attend with us uh please send somebody because we want to give somebody the keys to the church we want to if it's up you know and it's up to you bishop keep the prayer books and keep the uh processional cross uh he said yes to all three uh he didn't show up for the irish wake of course uh and that was it. We, we we had our service, closed the doors, gave the keys to the representative from the bishop's office, and th the rest is history. We planted a church in Watertown. It's still going to uh, going today. So, and now it's not every single parish that fought in Fort Worth is this way, but I think the majority of them were this this venal. And we have to say that there were some ACNA breakaway churches over the past decade that if they could have, they would have done what the uh, Fort Worth Episcopalians did. Sure. But that's no excuse for bad behavior. And if we're ever going to get past this difficult er time in our lives as Christians, you got to let go sometimes, folks, and just build the kingdom instead of fighting battles the only people who who prosper from this even now are lawyers in fort worth texas because the lawyers are going to be at it for another year or two to recover prayer books and processional crosses and toilet paper and, uh, it's just so foolish 
it is the, the pettiness of a worldview that I do not understand. Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to kind of move into a section here called worldviews. <laughs> because in our pre-show, George and I were going through some stories, and Kevin, I just don't understand this. George, I just don't understand this. And so this is the worldview section. And um, Africa, as a continent, has suffered greatly since kind of the early 70s from prosperity gospel teachers who have gone in there and said, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be wealthy. And just like Old Testament times, you can tell God is blessing you by how much you have. That's been something that Africa has suffered from. One of the famous ones is T.B. Joshua out of Nigeria. Uh, He is our age. And he recently succumbed to uh, room temperature. (laughs) How do you say this? Uh, TV Joshua died at 57 years of age. Uh, Easily the most famous uh, prosperity gospel preacher out of Nigeria. Uh, Owned Lear Jets. Was uh, famous. Loved by many people. And really made good on the promise that God was blessing him. And God wanted him to be rich. And if he's blessing me, he'll bless you. This is a major problem for T.G. Joshua's problems. And I'm just, all I can think of is the dead parrot sketch from Monty Python. No. (laughs) It's a dead parrot, you know, smacking the dead bird on the, and the sales clerk saying, no, no, it's, uh, it's resting. It's pining for the fjords. Yes. (laughs) T.D. Joshua was a, was the man in the prosperity gospel movement in Nigeria. And prosperity gospel is that if the Lord wants you to be rich, he wants you to be happy, he wants you to be successful, give money and you'll get it back tenfold. Give money to me and you'll get it back tenfold in blessings from the Lord. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would prophesy and he would uh, cast blessings and, and this was prosperity gospel mindset of promising people wealth and happiness and prosperity in this life has been a major sore in the side of the Church of Nigeria uh, about was it two years ago now that we ran we had a series of uh, shows about the prosperity gospel uh, proclivities of a new uh, a church of, of the new Church of Nigeria Bishop in the United States um, that the Church of Nigeria basically had to say to this guy, you can't talk this way anymore. It's not Anglican. Stop it. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) But the prosperity gospel is, we have have a friend of this show who teaches in a Nigerian seminary, and he says, you know, most of the young seminarians are enamored by the prosperity gospel, by its language, its vocabulary, and some by its beliefs. Well, the problem for T.P. Joshua is he died at 57. And he was famous for saying, YouTube kicked him off the air for saying that uh, he could cure homosexuality by prayer. Twitter kicked him off by saying that he could cure COVID by prayer. And his believers believe him. And now he's dead at 57 of undisclosed causes. He wasn't murdered. Uh, He wasn't a traffic accident, but he's dead. A building did not collapse on him, no. Uh, Yeah, and it's a funny thing. I think it was 2014. It was? His church in Buja or Lagos, the synagogue of all nations, collapsed during a service, killing 114 people. Mm -hmm. And it later turned out that it was shoddy construction, that there was kickbacks from the contractors uh, to T.B. Joshua. Uh, And so the the concrete was substandard, and the reinforced bar, somebody forgot to put it in the building. So when it fell down, it killed people worshiping. I survived that and but the prosperity gospel is a major problem in Africa in the United States as well and well it, it it continues because you know and TB Joshua was a master of this they mastered the communication using technology for communication telling people what they wanted to hear mm-hmm. you want to hear that God wants to bless you you want to hear that God provides and shows his love through wealth and through good health. 
and you know it, it's a very pal- palatable message you know the Sermon on the Mount is not a palatable message <laughs> people don't want to hear the, the truth of the New Testament they want to hear what what's in it for me and TB Joshua Benny uh, Hinn uh, the, the list goes on are there to tell you what you want to hear well, Joel Osteen in the United States yeah um, Joyce Meyer, yeah, oh, there, there are others. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth Copeland mm-hmm. will tell you that uh, sickness is a sign of God's displeasure with you. That suffering shows that you're not as good a Christian as you could be. Now, the problem with this is that that's contrary to Christ's clear words in Scripture: "Take up your cross and follow me." You will not. You will have suffering for following me in this life. This life you will have these problems, but being a Christian does not fill in the potholes in front of you as you go through life. It gives you life eternal and salvation through Jesus Christ. It's not magic. And what T.B. Joshua was promoting, what Joel Osteen promotes and Joyce Meyer promotes, I think she's backed away, but Joel Osteen Mm -hmm. really promotes a form of modern magic clothed in words that uh, attract a Nigeria audience for T.B. Joshua and an American audience for Joel Osteen. What it is not, it is not Christian. This neo-Pentecostalism uh, is not true, true Pentecostalism. It's uh, paganism with an overlay of Christian words. Talk, I don't talk to Joel, ask Joel Osteen about sin. Ask about total depravity. Ask about the fallenness, about the fall. And what do you'll get? You'll get a smile, and God loves you, and he wants you to be rich. And and uh, don't worry about that. Be happy. Well, Joe Osteen is famous for his Oprah interview where she asked him, you know, what are, is this a sin? Is this a sin? He goes, I don't want people to come to my services burdened about, you know, their sins. I want them to, to leave with a... Uh, you know, a, a, a happy step and a big smile, and well, that's what you're doing. You, but you're you, you're deceiving them as to uh, their relationship with the Father, mm-hmm. and you're deceiving them because you want them not to feel sad for themselves and not to have an understanding of the, the concepts of what separates us from the Father. And we need to be careful uh, because we're using terms that some people might not particularly interpret. We are not saying that Pentecostals, the Assemblies of God, for instance, are non-Christian. Oh, what so, we're, yeah. we're, what we're, because they teach false doctrine. No, we may not agree with some of their doctrine, but we're talking about the neo-Pentecostals, people that arose out of the past Pentecostal movement and then moved into the name it and claim it and into prosperity, and somebody like Joel Osteen, I would say, is not a Christian because he teaches things that put him outside the structures of the church. I don't mean institutional structures, but faith structures and issues of sin and redemption and the lie that you can have it all today and all you have to do is pay and pray. That's a lie. Indeed. A worldview I do not understand. You know, in as such, I also want to move on and talk to a talk about uh, uh, Archbishop Nicholas Nicole, who we got the surprise story that we put up that he is recovering from a near death uh, illness, and I, I like, I didn't know he was sick, and uh, we did not have an opportunity to to pray for him. He has recovered, and it's an interesting story, George. Yes, we published a statement, uh, or or a public statement he gave at a a, uh, Thanksgiving for his healing service that was held uh, about a week ago in Nigeria, in Abuja. As Kevin said, we were not aware that he was ill, but evidently after he retired, shortly thereafter he became very, very ill. And in listening to his testimony, it, it recounts the struggles he had, and at a certain point, it, he, his family was saying, well, can we take him to a hospital in Dubai or Abu Dhabi um, or India or Singapore for medical treatment? Because the Nigerian doctors were basically not able to help him. And the Nigerian, the collapse of Nigeria as a country meant that the 
you know, if you're a good doctor, you try to get out of Nigeria. And uh, so it, it's a mess. It's a basket case, Nigeria. As the current archbishop said, Nigeria is on its way to becoming the next Somalia. Mm -hmm. Well, and then Somalia, so, yeah. so the archbishop said, finally, I was able to get into a hospital in South Africa. But I said to myself, if I'm going to be in an African hospital, I might as well stay here in Nigeria. And he survived so that my family is around me and they know that I, you know, can visit, they can visit me. Well, he pulled through and he thanked the doctors for their care. He also thanked government officials who intervened on his behalf to get him into clinics. Then he said, so all of this is wonderful news that he survived, praise God. Then he said something that was on that Kevin and George, we don't understand this. Don't understand. He said, I'm so glad I didn't die after my primacy ended because then people would accuse my wife of witchcraft and killing me. Now, Kevin, if you died suddenly, would people think Whit Jill had you murdered? By Probably, you yeah, know, there's no question about that. I mean, so, something nefarious happened if, if Kevin goes. But uh, uh, the witchcraft thing, you know, we talk about Af Africa frequently, and they have a different worldview on some issues. Uh, witchcraft being one of them. I talked last week about the uh, city I went to in Tanzania where everybody was wearing a red amulet because they, they thought that would protect them from uh, something. And there's there's this spiritual worldview they have that I don't have, George. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about witchcraft in the United States, we basically think of weird young women uh, who paint their nails black and uh, hang out at, uh, at uh, coffee bars in Salem, Massachusetts. It's, it's, not, it's a non-serious uh, issue but hold but, on let, let, let's back up witchcraft is real yes okay uh you know the, the cursing and you know to you know cast a curse and stuff like that the desire of witches to destroy things that is real okay but our worldview in the united in in american christendom i'll, I'll say is that witchcraft has been overcome by jesus christ i mean it's ineffective um uh, because of uh, the Christ history on the cross and that Satan's already been defeated. Now, that, that's just, you know, George, an American Protestant talking. But I don't really have a, uh, if somebody dies, I don't think witchcraft. Mm -hmm. the, spir the spirit in the demon world in Africa is much closer, I don't want to say to the surface, but it's the worldview is very different, such that uh, People, if Archbishop Oko died uh, from an undisclosed disease shortly after he left office, his wife was in danger of being accused of being a witch. And what do they do to witches in Africa? They don't weigh them to see if they weigh more than a duck. That's another Monty Python. Monty Python. Well, you're all Monty Python today, you know. <laughs> what, what they do, what they do is they kill them. That w uh, killing of witches in Zimbabwe, in Tanzania, Malawi, and Nigeria happens all the time. A killing of women accused of witchcraft. One of the things Kevin and I uh, saw when we were in Tanzania for the uh, primates meeting. Well, I remember this. There's there's a church organization, Society for the Protection of Albinos, yeah. and. I have to say that sounds almost like a made-up thing. If you had a society for protection of albinos, it would basically in the United States it would be like a worthy little weird institution, you know. Let's leave it serious. Now in Tanzania, one of the tribal groups there has a genetic tendency to produce albi albinism, albinos in their population. An albino child cannot be left to play outside by itself because it will be kidnapped and will be killed for its body parts to use in witchcraft. Albinos are persecuted and murdered for their body parts. And you and the church has taken a role in combating the uh, al, al, the murder of albinos and, and but they combat the use of witchcraft against albinos not as we would in a uh, legal way but in a spiritual way saying this is part of the spiritual warfare against the spirits of darkness but when uh, we raise all this not to belittle Africa which please don't hear me to be saying that or to be belittle the American semi-secular worldview but rather to say it's so easy to assume that people think just the way we do 
uh, in different parts of the world, in different parts of the country. Uh, you know, we make assumptions about culture that often, more often than not, are not correct. And it takes us, and it also always behooves us to, I mean, even with my own children, sometimes they speak a different language. Yes. <laughs> now, we can go about 10 hours on this episode just to cover the last week in Kevin's and George's life. But with our own children, mm. we're in a different world. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, my children were raised as Christians, um, uh, professed you know, to be Christians for much of their lives, uh, are participating in cultural things which I, as a man of the 80s, a Christian of the 80s, don't think uh, is beneficial to their their walk well i had as i mentioned i had my daughter laura here and mm. she's been helping me organize my record collection I, I had records and i they've been in a box for 20 years and she was playing them and she asked me dad what is this sound i can't don't understand it and she had gotten an, a duran duran album out and she was playing the Duran Duran, and at the start of this song, there was this clicking noise. Is there something wrong with the record? The song was Girls on Film. Laura had never heard the shutter of a mechanical camera and had no idea what it was. She's 25 years old. Mm -hmm. We went shopping, uh, and, and she's not she's not stupid. Uh, no. We were shopping at Publix the other day, and Susan had given us a list to buy groceries and spaghetti sauce, and we're going down the aisle. And I said, oh, well, and I mentioned, oh, I saw a movie with him the other day, and she's looking over at the spaghetti jars. What? And there's Paul Newman. I said, what, what about that guy? That's Paul Newman. Well, who's Paul Newman? Who's Paul Newman? My daughter does not know who Cool Hand Luke is. What we have here, George, he, is a he, failure to a, communicate. He's the spaghetti king of aisle <laughs> seven at Publix in Crystal River, Florida. And this is my own child, so that when we think we understand the African worldview, and when our own kids don't understand us, we really are in some... We're, we have, Kevin, as you can repeat that line from Struther Martin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what we have here is a failure to communicate. And we do. Well, we do, and, and I but mean that. Our, and Kevin, that there's another story we had on Anglican Inc., where you and I read this, and I'm thinking, what is with these people? I don't know if if you well, want to kick it off or if you want. Well, to no, it. which well, yeah, tell me which story. There's there's like 20 new stories a week. It's hard to keep up with you, George. Well, St. Helens Bishopgate, uh, oh, okay. big evangelical mega parish, mm -hmm. put out a letter to his congregation about uh, the Jonathan Smythe, uh, John, uh, Jonathan Fletcher, John Smythe abuse cases and had its clergy, had a culture of bullying been in the church, had any of its clergy been part of the cover up and this and that and the other. William Taylor is a heavy hitter in the English evangelical world. He's the rector of St. Helens Bishop Gate. And there have been calls by uh, people in the Church of England that he step away from his leadership in senior evangelical organizations as is alleged that he knew of the abuse of Fletcher and this and this and that. Well, in this letter to the congregation, William it said that William Taylor himself was a victim of John Smythe. And it said when he was 20 years old, he went to Smythe's home and was beaten by Smythe on two occasions. Now, I don't understand. Now, William Taylor, I've met a few times at church conferences. He's a very dynamic, rugged. This is not some introvert who, you, who beats and then hides in a corner. Yeah. Kevin, if you were 20 years old, and, you and I was beaten. once. You were once. <laughs> what What is the reaction? What would well, you have done I, as a Midwestern I, boy? I, growing up in the farm culture of the Midwest, uh, the, the beating would not have happened. Okay. It may have been suggested. It may have been tried. It, it just wouldn't have happened. 
Uh, it, it, I would have done everything I could have to stop it, whether it be a, a pastor, a priest of mine, or some spiritual influence, because I had enough of an understanding that there is no beatings in Christianity, in my understanding of the kingdom. And so it would not occur. That's why I, I read these stories about what happened in England, a a westernized country, uh, educated people, and I, I don't get how this would happen. It, if an attempt were made to uh, 1982, or how old was it, 1985, uh, um, Kevin, for a beating, I would have instantly reported to the authorities and, you know, certainly would have told Dad. Dad would have taken care of that. I mean, just like... <laughs> <laughs> it, and so when I read something like this from a, a westernized country, I don't get it. I, I Why? And, and okay, yes, there is a victim here. W William's a victim. John Smythe had many victims. How did John Smythe have this much uh, power to beat people and not be turned in? I, and that's, I mean, kept my experience, though I grew up in a different part of the country, uh, in a different world than Kevin's, uh, they would have been the same. And, and I think where it is, is that uh, maybe as Americans, or a, a, we as American men of a certain generation, of a uh, certain pigmentation, of a certain language set, you know, we have a sense of individual autonomy that would not allow this to be done. And the big man culture of that we are seeing in British evangelicalism that the Jonathan Fletcher can do no wrong, the John Smythes can do no wrong, that that is absent from our culture. Um, and I just sometimes don't understand how it was allowed to get to this point. Well, and I don't want to completely mis misrepresent William Taylor here. Um, in his statement, he says, I became a Christian in December 1979. At age t 18, I first remember meeting John Smith uh, in July 1981. As a young Christian, age 20, I was deceived by John Smith and was first beaten in Smythe Shed in August of 1981. I recall being beaten twice more the last in early December 1981. After that, I never went again. I reported the beatings to the minister of the church I was attending at the at the time. He did report this. Mm -hmm. Where yeah, there should be police reports. There should be yeah. You know, why didn't the, the minister? Why didn't uh, Kevin's right? And if I've mm -hmm. misspoken, I apologize to William Taylor. I'm not no. saying he did anything wrong, but the no. world in which he was living. He was sent back, or he went back two more times after the first incident. The minister, a man whom he should have had complete trust in, covered this up or didn't believe him. Uh, what world do we live in? Now, we can point to the Catholic abuse scandals. Um, they seem to, though, to have been focused more on boys like 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. And there are some Episcopal scandals of this nature as well. So I'm not saying it's a, only an English problem. Where I'm coming is that the big man culture of uh, evangelicalism, I guess also in the United States as well, of uh, these evangelical leaders, here my thoughts in point are developing <laughs> as we talk, because you know, you're seeing some stuff like from the Hillsong community of their leaders falling by the wayside for sexual scandal issues. I'm glad that they're falling so quickly and not letting it just hang out because they are people of, you know, they're wonderful. Um, and therefore, because they're ministers, we cannot, you know, one of the things that when we were talking about the Uganda adultery scandal, our critics were saying, thou shall not harm God's anointed meaning you can't say anything bad that Stanley Intigal, about Stanley Intigali because he was God's anointed as Archbishop. That worldview is just so foreign. So, Yeah. Um, to any of you listening, um, if you find yourself in these situations, 
uh, and you're, you're reporting it and you're not getting uh, the reactions you need, uh, the accountability from authorities, reach out to George and I. We will make it happen. Uh, this is absolutely ridiculous to, to read something like this. Uh, if you have been harmed in the past, you need to get counseling. Um, well, there, there's there's no two ways about it. You, you some of you're gonna have some PTSD. Some of you're just gonna have an inability to relate uh, on a very personal level uh, to mentors and and people who want to help you spiritually now that you you're beyond this. So, Kevin, you sparked a memory of mine because a few years ago, one of our viewers contacted me to say that they had been. Uh, assaulted by an Episcopal priest when they were in college in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I will write, tell me. I, I said, now that you have told me this, it is my duty. I'd have no discretion in this matter. Mm -hmm. I will contact the Diocese of Atlanta. So I contacted their uh, oh, intake officer for discipline mm -hmm. and I said, I am reporting to you that I have been told by this person that this event took place involving this priest. I have no first-hand knowledge, but I am letting you know that this needs to be addressed. And I followed up about, and about six, seven months later, the, the fellow wrote to me and said, I hadn't heard anything. So I wrote again, and I spoke to the canon of the ordinary in my diocese. And the canon in the ordinary in my diocese said, well, this may be a case where a bishop needs to talk to another bishop to get people off, uh, off yes. the stump. <laughs> and then I heard back, well, the guy's been dead for 15 years. What do they want us to do? I said, that's not my decision. Yeah. But just because the guy's dead doesn't mean the church doesn't need to address this. Absolutely. And whether, whether it's a pastoral response that's needed, whether there's... I don't know, it's not my call how to do this, but uh, another thing that uh, I, I, a few years ago, I had a member of the congregation come to me to accuse the husband of one of the members of my vestry of molesting their child. And I listened to what he said. It said he wasn't comfortable that the eight-year-old would sit on the, the, uh, the man's lap during our Bible studies and he would tickle her ribs. And I said, I don't think that's molestation. Have you anything other? She says, no, but I'm positive there's something going on. Well, I have no discretion in that. I wrote to Florida Children's Family Services. I wrote to the diocese and I wrote to the church insurance company, laid it all out, had acknowledgments from all three and never heard a single thing. And all these years later, that family's still here, meaning Florida Family and Children's Services investigated, found nothing. So I knew my, I was 99 and 910 sure it was false, but even then I had an, a, an obligation and not to just leave it with the church, but go to the state. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a sad commentary that we need to rely upon the state to get the church to do the right thing. Uh, well, the, the, we've learned that over and over again. England has learned that. England doesn't rely on the state. Uh, they certainly had some trouble in Australia where uh, they've said the state needs to have an oversight of the church. So, And, and here's the funny thing, and then it goes overboard like that the, uh, the cardinal in Australia was railroaded in a false case uh, mm -hmm. and the prosecution were out to get him. And what a world we live in where there's just such well, I will be the first to say there are wicked priests. There are wicked priests in, wicked priests, wicked ministers in every denomination. And there are also wicked prosecutors, and wicked judges, Very, yeah. and wicked, wicked people in this world. And we just need as Christians to do the right thing, no matter the consequence yeah. to the institution. We live in a world where a prosecutor is judged on his victories. Mm -hmm. uh, and not on the dispensation of justice. Mm -hmm. It's a world I do not understand, George. 
I hope you agree with me. All right, well, we've hit, what, 49 minutes? Well, that's a perfect 667. Well, let's yeah. see. What have we done today? Witchcraft, <laughs> albinos, child abuse. I mean, uh -huh. this, this is our happy Friday episode. <laughs> I got Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah. yeah, yeah. Where did the week go? We'll be happy on Friday. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> and I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 667 of Anglican Unscripted. So in your worldview, you don't even understand how the calendar works. I, I, I've seen I, the no, I, I'm still on the Julian calendar or the Gregor I, Gregorian. I, yeah, I don't know which calendar I'm working on.